My name is Tiara Guy, and I'm the Associate Director of Industry Relations and Marketing Operations at Sound Exchange. I've been with the company for more than 12 years um, and got my start there in our data management department, which really allowed me to build a foundation based on data management and how our systems worked and how we connect recordings to the appropriate creators and sound recording copyright owners in order to get them paid. One of the major roles and responsibilities of my current team is to find these creators that we have digital performance royalties for, to let them know that these royalties exist, how to register for them with Sound Exchange in order to connect those royalties to the appropriate creators and rights owners. Sound Exchange is a nonprofit digital performance royalty collection organization. We collect digital performance royalties specifically on behalf of featured performers and whoever owns the sound recording copyrights anytime you know their recordings are streamed by cable, internet, or satellite radio. So it's really important to understand that Sound Exchange only covers non-interactive digital streaming services, which means you can't be able to queue up exactly what song you want to hear. So it would not be Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Um, again, it has to have that streaming component where you can't be, you know, queuing up exactly what you want to hear. And, you know, it's not just music. So the creators that we cover also include comedy and spoken word. Knowing your revenue streams and where you can collect is so important. And it is different than a BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, GMR. You know, they're covering writing, publishing, composing, whereas Sound Exchange covers featured performance and ownership of the sound recording anytime it's streamed through one of those non interactive platforms using our license. If it's a website where people are clicking what they want to listen to, then it's interactive and it's probably audiovisual in some cases, in which case it doesn't fall under that compulsory license that Sound Exchange administers. A digital performance is a public performance of a recording by any one of the four classes of digital services as defined by the Section 114 of the Copyright Act. Number one would be like an eligible non-subscription service, like a non-interactive webcaster or simulcaster that charges no fees. Two would be a pre-existing subscription service, like a residential subscription service, which begins providing music over digital cable or satellite TV um, prior to July 1998, according to the law. The third would be a new subscription service, like a non-interactive webcaster or simulcaster that does charge a fee, as well as residential subscription services, and they provide music over digital cable or satellite TV, again, since that July 1998 date. And then the fourth being pre-existing satellite digital audio radio services like Sirius XM. The history of digital public performances for sound recordings is a result of two laws, the Sound Recordings Act of 1995 and the 1998 Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So webcasters, satellite radio broadcasters, and cable broadcasters are required to pay royalties to sound recording copyright owners when they digitally transmit their sound recordings in addition to the royalties that are due to the musical work copyright holders. In the Sound Recordings Act of 1995, the U.S. Congress passed the Digital Performance Right, which granted copyright owners and sound recordings an exclusive right to perform their works publicly, and that's limited to digital audio transmission to their sound recordings. And then the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 clarified that the digital performance right also applied to sound recordings performed by non-interactive, non-subscription internet radio broadcasters like webcasters. And it's notable to note that the 1995 law specifically exempts terrestrial or over-the-air FM radio broadcasts from the digital performance right. To obtain a statutory license, you have to first notify the sound recording copyright owners by filing a notice of use of the sound recording under statutory license notice of use with the Copyright Office. All services must file a notice of use prior to making their first ephemeral copy or first digital transmission of a sound recording to avoid being subject to liability for copyright infringement. An original notice of use with a $50 filing fee should be sent to the Copyright Royalty Board at the U.S. Copyright Office, and they have an address located on that form. And then the Copyright Office will provide you with any confirmation that it's received your notice of use. And once a service files its notice of use, it can commence making digital audio transmissions, provided that it complies with all the terms and conditions of the statutory license, makes all the payments, and files all statements of accounts and reports when due. 
services providing a notice of use are subject to the default rates and the terms of the statutory license is set by the Copyright Royalty Board and services wishing to operate under alternative rates or terms that are pursuant to the Webcaster Settlement Act, for example, should follow instructions prescribed in those rates and terms. And Sound Exchange actually has if you're a licensee that wants to start a service and start using the compulsory license that Sound Exchange administers, the compulsory license, which is the government license, allows you to stream whatever you want as long as you're sending those reports of play and paying for the license that you're using. And so Sound Exchange is actually part of the copyright royalty rate proceedings. You can find all those rates when you use our licensee registration through our website. We'll help you calculate what you owe and how to pay and everything through like a really easy wizard on our website. So if you are a featured performer or sound recording copyright owner, which is typically a record label, but definitely does not always have to be, you're going to want to register with Sound Exchange. So Sound Exchange is nonprofit. It's free to register. You're going to want to do so through our website. We have an online registration portal. You can easily access it on our website. It should only take you about five minutes if you have everything you need. Um, but you're going to be registering as either a featured performer, sound recording copyright owner, or both. And you should view the registration as setting up your payment place and how you want to receive payment. Once you actually submit your registration and we process it and create your account with your profiles, whether it's artist, rights owner, or both, then you'll log into our SX Direct portal, which is our self-service portal, where you'll actually claim the recordings that should be linked to your account for payment. So you don't want to just register and think everything's taken care of because we need you to actually claim the recordings that you should be getting paid for so that we can link them to your account accordingly. What is a letter of direction? Who needs it and why? A letter of direction um, can be used for a featured artist to allocate a portion of their royalty to a creative participant on a recording. A creative participant being a producer, a mixer, or an engineer. Sound Exchange covers royalties for featured performers and sound recording copyright owners, but this is a way that we can take a directive from an artist who wants to allocate a portion of what they're claiming to that creative participant. And then Sound Exchange uses that letter of direction to create an account for that producer, mixer, engineer, so that they can get paid directly from Sound Exchange. The major difference being that they're not seen as a direct registrant and that they can't claim recordings themselves as a producer, mixer, engineer. They can only get paid through that letter of direction. With sound recording copyright owners at Sound Exchange, we do require a few additional things. For example, you can submit metadata for recordings directly to Sound Exchange. That option won't even appear for artists who are only registered with a performer profile. But if you're registered with a sound recording copyright owner profile or the both option of both performer and rights owner, then you have the ability to submit metadata directly to us. And it just helps on the back end to have more pristine metadata so that we're able to connect it, like I said, to the artists and rights owners who need to get paid for the usage of that recording. Letters of direction are not really necessary on the sound recording copyright owner side because copyright owners can just register directly with Sound Exchange and claim their percentage. Producers, mixers, and engineers can't register directly to claim percentages. So letters of direction is something that Sound Exchange has been doing for a number of years out of courtesy. And then after the passage of the Music Modernization Act, it kind of codified that process into law. And so it's at the artist directive and it has to be signed off by the artist team because it's their portion of royalty that they're allowing to be directed to that creative participant. On the rights owner side, that's not necessary. If you're splitting ownership of the recording, then if it's a 50-50 split, one owner registers, claims 50%, the other person can register directly and claim their 50%. My advice for newer performers, for sound recording copyright owners is to just do your best to understand your business. A huge part of my work at Sound Exchange is trying to handle, you know, make doing your business and collecting your royalties as easy as possible so that you're freed up to just create and be able to like earn these royalties in a fair, efficient, very simple way. 
Um, but understanding that multiple revenue streams exist, that if you're a writer, publisher, composer, featured performer, rights owner, there are different organizations that you have to register for in order to collect your royalties. And knowing that they don't always overlap, that you actually need to be with multiple organizations in order to maximize your revenue collection. Creators, rights owners, you're basically small business owners. Like you have to know your business in order to be able to collect this money that allows you to keep moving forward and keep growing in this business and being able to accomplish all the things you want. I get really amazing stories from creators and rights owners about how their sound exchange checks can help them fund their next album or keep the lights on in their studio for another month so that they can put a new album out. I think that every cent counts. And so you don't want to leave anything on the table. Many performance rights organizations may have a retroactive cutoff. So for example, Sound exchange royalties are retroactive for up to three years. So you want to make sure you're registering with these companies that you need to register, claim your recordings so that you're not leaving any money on the table.